Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump, a weekly show in which uh, we have a discussion with someone who has undergone a spiritual awakening of some kind, um, preferably a, one of a permanent or abiding nature. Uh, my name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is James Braha. Uh, I'll let James um, introduce himself in terms of what he does and all that kind of thing, but as I understand it, James, you are a professional astrologer. Is, is that what you do exclusively for a living? These days I do a lot of things. I do investing in gold and silver stocks, uh -huh. and, I do, and I, I do a little bit of astrology, not as much as I used to. Okay. Um, and I, I talk some non-duality pretty much when people call up with questions or email. Uh -huh. I, don't, I don't... One of the odd things was that I always thought that if I had ever gotten to the end of my search that I'd you know, bang down the doors of everybody and tell them, hey, I got this great stuff, but it turns out that, that you know, there's not really much need for that. People are you know, okay as they are, and if they want it, then I'm available. Yeah. Yeah, I was more of a door banger in the early days myself, you know, kind of a wild-eyed zealot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, you tend to kind of mellow out both with age and I think with yeah. more spiritual maturity or whatever. Um, I, I li I've listened to one interview that you gave on uh, the Ur Urban Guru Cafe series. Um, in fact, I've listened to all about 75 of the interviews on that, on that series. Right. And uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about some of the th my impressions of that uh, as we go along uh, and, and get into the discussion. But I understand, and, and I also have a copy of your book right behind me here, someplace on the shelf. Uh, it's blue, living yeah, here. Here it is, right yep. there. J James, James was kind enough to send me this book um, a number of years ago after he wrote it. And um, you can talk about the book during the course of an interview, but it was a, it's a discussion of the summer you spent uh, hosting Sailor Bob, whom we, I'm sure you'll also talk about during the interview. So um, maybe uh, if you feel it's relevant and, and you'd like to do it this way, why don't you sketch for us the sort of the, you know, the, the main highlights of, of your personal path, you know, what, what, what you kind of went through and that led you to where you are now. Okay. I started at the age of around 20 with Transcendental Meditation, and I was immediately taken with it, and I was immediately, you know, struck by the spiritual path. And um, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll get enlightened, I'll spend, you know, seven or eight years or ten years. <laughs> and uh, by about eight or nine years, I realized that there had been so much intense growth and I realized that, <laughs> that that if there was that much growth in 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 ten years, and I still wasn't there, it looked like a long, many lifetime path. But but I did a lot of stuff. You know, after I got to around twenty eight, twenty nine, I did all kinds of different spiritual techniques and paths and whatever I could do. Um, at the same time, I had also around the age of thirty. I'd also realized that I didn't want my life to be about me. So that's when I went and started doing astrology, and I had a spiritual career, which is what I wanted, and I did that for a long time. And over the years, I did everything I could possibly do, and there was plenty of frustration because you could I could never get to the goal. I would get better, I'd get, I'd get more alert, I'd get more relaxed, I'd, I'd get more of everything, and yet the same sense of separateness that was there from the beginning was still there you know these other changes didn't make a dent in the in the sense of bondage or suffering and then i got to a point where i realized that i didn't even care anymore about powers and bliss and all that i just wanted to get to the truth and i wanted to get to the end of suffering the end of a set that the the end of of this life as an individual identity, etc. Around 1997 or something like that, I was at an astrology conference, and somebody came up after my lecture, and they started talking. And my wife said, "Oh, I know you from Fairfield," and so we started talking. And I said, "Well, you know, 30 years have gone by, and nobody's getting enlightened." And he said, "Oh, that's not true." 
I said, really? He said, yeah, I'll get you a book. So he got me a book called Meeting Papaji. Mm -hmm. And this was, that was the start of non-duality for me. And as I, the more I read of that stuff, the more I felt like, gee, I could really be close to something. It, this non-duality gave you the feeling like there was something imminent, something imminent. Well, who wrote that one, by the way? Uh, that one, I'm not sure. I'm not okay. sure. David Godman wrote one uh -huh. that was called um, uh, "Nothing Ever Happened," which is a three-volume set. But this one, <laughs> yeah, that three, was, three volumes on "Nothing Ever it, Happened." That's pretty good. Happened. It was incredible. Book. But anyway, <laughs> the other one was put together by one of the disciples after Papa G had died. Right. This was really frustrating because you know I read this great book of this guy who did all these miracles. And he was dead. Right. So I started looking into you know his disciples and things like that. And then, you know, that was for a few years, and I went through diff seeing different gurus and things. And then I picked up this. Actually, uh, I was speaking to a, a client named Merrill, and she said, "Well, you know, the best non-duality book is Sailor Bob Adamson, and it's called What's Wrong with Right Now Unless You Think About It." Mm -hmm. I picked up that book. And in the first three pages, I knew I had to see this guy. I had to see him. However, about two or three years before that, I had gotten on a plane to go to England, and I had a full-blown panic attack. I didn't know that's what it was. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a heart attack and, and claustrophobia on the plane. It was horrible. Huh. And at that point, I, I knew I wasn't flying you know any long distances yeah. so i did some i did some work to try to find out why this panic had happened and it turned out to be one of the most wonderful things for my life because when i realized i had to see this sailor bob I, i'd been on a plane since the panic attack but i wasn't going you know over an ocean <laughs> i wasn't ready for that to but, australia yeah so i called him and then i you know i i basically invited him to come here paid his way he brought his wife. He stayed for five weeks in my house, mm -hmm. and that was, you know, that was it. Yeah, it was within those five weeks that that uh, that I I fully got non-duality. Mm -hmm. You guys actually invited me to come down for that, but it, I couldn't just uproot and come down for five weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for the invitation, anyway. Cool. Oh, okay, so you fully got non non-duality. So, I better explain what that means, because many listeners might not know. Okay, well, n the term non-duality is the translation for the, t for the term Advaita, right. which means not to, mm -hmm. which essentially means that um, what, is, what really exists is oneness, mm -hmm. and then there's an appearance of duality, there is a dream going on. The essence of non-duality, the essence, and really the only way a person will ever get it, is to do the search of, of either who am I or who is this me, what is this me. And if you do that search, if you look to find, an in, if I look to find an individual James, mm -hmm. there's four things I can find. Mm -hmm. I can find a physical body, yeah. I can find thoughts thoughts going on and I can find feelings mm -hmm. those are those are going on all the time and the other thing that is there is emptiness or nothingness or consciousness whatever you want to call it and it's not a thing it's not hot it's not cold it's not black or white it just is that's been here since before I was born or I should say before the body was born and the mind and the thoughts and that will be here when the body and thoughts and feelings are long gone. That as far as we know, I mean, there are materialists who argue that that is not the case. But you know, I, I agree with you, and uh, well, and many people do. Experientially, I don't know. You know, objectively, who can say? Right. But but my own experience, and this is interesting because when I was, you know, toward the end of the of the path before Sailor Bob got here, I had been reading a lot of Nisargadatta Maharaj. Uh -huh. And uh, he was always saying, be with the I am. He doesn't mean the words I am. He means be with the sense of presence that's always there. Right. And, and I would do that every night in bed. 
I would sit and contemplate or meditate or be with the 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 beingness, uh -huh. not the mind, not the body, but just the awareness or beingness. And there was one thing that I sort of brought in, and that was that uh, when I was seeking, I had always heard that these people that said that they had woken up, they would always say that when I gained enlightenment, I realized I had always been enlightened. Right. So I said, well, this is crazy. So if they're, if I'm enlightened now, but I just don't know it, well, let me see what the hell's going on here that's so great. <laughs> you know, where's this enlightenment? Yeah. Cause I, because Good. that's what they all said. Right. But at, so so at night I would I would be with that I am, mm -hmm. but or that that awareness. But the main thrust of non-duality is to look and see if you can find an individual self that is lasting. The body comes and goes, the thoughts come and go. Mm -hmm. And the feelings come and go, so that's not my true nature. Right. The only other thing that's there with me 24/7 is nothingness or emptiness or awareness. Once you know that, then it's over. Now I, it doesn't mean I, I don't suffer like anybody else. It doesn't mean I don't get depressed like anybody else. It doesn't mean if somebody punches me in the face, I don't go, "Ow, that hurt and it hurt me," and punch them back. You know, it yeah. doesn't mean that. It just means that I I understand now. I know. My true nature is the emptiness that's always here, and the body, the mind, and the thoughts and feelings, they come and go. That's not me. Well, uh, who suffers? Who has the emotions? Whose nose gets broken when you get punched in the face? Appearance who feels of, that pain? An appearance of James. However, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like an appearance of James. It feels like a me. Right. It still feels like, ow, that hurt me. Yeah. If you put, you put my head in a vice, I'm going to say, ow, that's hurting me. Right. But but if you put a gun in my, my my head and said, who is it really hurting? Is that is that really you that's in that vice? I say no, absolutely not. That's an appearance of me. Right. But that has to be gotten. People people oftentimes will go through that search, and they'll say, yes, I understand. I'm not the body. I'm not the thoughts. I'm not the feelings. Uh, you know, I realize I am the emptiness or nothingness. And 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 then you say, is your search over? And they go, well well no. <laughs> because because it's like the conviction is 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 not there mm -hmm. so it's like a person who who sees the blue water in an ocean and you say look is the water blue or is it not and they say well no of course it's not blue they know it's not really blue and they say well do you really know that or is it an intellectual thing no i really know the water's not blue same thing right. so you have to once you realize that you are the emptiness that conviction has to be there in order for the freedom of that non-duality will give. Non-duality doesn't bring bliss necessarily or or anything like that, but it does relieve you of tremendous amount of psychological suffering. And how does that conviction get established? How questions are, <laughs> are impossible to answer. I can answer that from the point of view of reality, mm -hmm. which is that there is no conviction, there is no me, there is no world, the whole thing's a dream. Mm -hmm. It's like a dream. It's it's like you saying, how does the baseball, you know, you had a dream last night of the baseball stadium. How did that baseball stadium, how did the player do what he did? Right. And, well, it's just happening. Mm -hmm. On the level of the appearance, however, you're asking me how does that happen, there's different things I can say within the appearance. Like I was just speaking with a, a, a seeker the other day, and, um, um, you know, basically he understood everything, but yet wasn't willing to give up his search. And it was clear to me that he wasn't earnest or serious. Hmm. Now, this is a real interesting thing. You, you know, you have a seeker, this seeker had been around for 35 years seeking and spent his whole life at it, gave up all sorts of stuff to be on the search. And here I am saying, you're just not being serious. You're not taking it seriously. Right. And then I gave me. I I said, let me ask you. If I put a, if someone put a gun to your head and said, you know, answer this correctly, we'll let you live. What are you? The thoughts, feelings, and the body, or are you the emptiness or nothingness? He said, I would say the nothingness. I said, then why can't you? Why are you not unable to? You know, if you understand that, and know that. Why are you? Why is the conviction not there? And you know, eventually he said, "Well, it, it scares me to think that I'm not really here. It scares me to think that the world isn't real." You know, so 
that's a process that that like Sailor Bob was here for five weeks and and even on the last day he was here, I was still asking him questions. Mm -hmm. Now this is fascinating because the day that Sailor Bob got well, he got here at night uh, on a Wednesday night or something. The next morning, I looked out my window about seven in the morning, and he was outside the cottage sitting under a, a fruit tree. And I went out there. It was the first talk we had had on anything spiritual. And the first thing I said to him, I said, Bob, is it really true that the, the world isn't real? <laughs> and he said, of course it's not real. Uh -huh. Look at it. Analyze it. It comes and goes like a dream. Mm -hmm. Now, this is fascinating because... I knew that at the age of 20, it, you know, reading the spiritual books, they would always say that the world is an illusion, the world is Maya. Mm -hmm. But at the age of 20 and 25 and 30 and 35 and 40, that statement had no meaning. Mm -hmm. Now, here was a man that I trusted, uh, you know, and it wasn't just his book. When he got, I'd read his book and all, but when he got here, you know, I was going to look in his eyes and see, do I trust this guy? And I knew right away this was not a fraud. This was a genuine, you know, this was someone who knew something. Right. So when he said, of course it's not real, analyze it, look at it, he wasn't saying something I didn't know. Mm -hmm. However, at that point, and I didn't realize it, but at that point, my, my path was over. <laughs> it was over. And still I was asking questions and why this and how that. And it wasn't until about two weeks after he left, about two weeks after he left, I remember getting up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, which is, was a normal occurrence for me. I used to, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes it still is. And when I would get up in the middle of the night, up until this point, about, you know, I don't know, a week or two after he left, I would wake up in the middle of the night, I would go to the toilet, and the thoughts would begin. What if I can't pay the rent? What if what 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 happens when I die? What's what's going to be like for my son when I die? What if this? What if that? What's going to happen when I? All this craziness. Mm -hmm. What's the next shoe that's going to drop? Is what would occur every night when I go to the bathroom, and that's the stuff that was going on all day long anyway. Yeah. When am I going to get enlightened? <laughs> about so it was about a week or two after he had gone. I got up to go to the bathroom, and I just went to the bathroom. Mm. There was no craziness. There was no, why this? What if that? What about this? What about that? Mm -hmm. I was just, it just was gone. Yeah. And at that point, I said, oh, it, it's taken hold. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because even while he was here, one of the funniest things was a couple of days before he left, I said, Bob, Bob, I have a question. I have a question. What do I say to a seeker when they ask X, Y, Z? Mm -hmm. And he said, what are you talking about? You're talking about something that's in the future? There is no future. I said, yeah, yeah, I know, but, but what am I going to answer to this question? He said, James, you're asking me about something that doesn't exist. Uh -huh. When the time gets here, you know, whatever you'll answer is what you'll answer. That's the kind of thing Eckhart Tolle might say. You know, he says he goes to give a lecture. He just basically, you know, gets in the car. He's riding to the lecture, enjoying the car ride. He gets up on the stage, sits in his chair, you know, <laughs> and he starts to talk, and it just kind of comes out. And you know, people will ask him a question; they'll answer it when they ask it. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and 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 later on, I had this student that used to come every so often, and she'd say, "James, I, I get it now when I'm here with you, mm -hmm. but I know because it's happened several times before. I'm going to go in my tomorrow." I'll lose it. What what do I do then? Uh -huh. What do I do then? And I said, you're asking me about some future. There is no future. Whatever happens, happens in the now. Mm -hmm. Worry about it in the now. Right. But it's you funny know, you should mention, like, you know, when you were 20, because I was thinking as you were talking about when I was 18, and I was basically a stoned-out hippie, but I used to read a lot of philosophical books and spiritual books and Zen books and so on. And, you know, I... I was quite familiar with this idea that the world is an illusion and, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, I was a mess. You know, I mean, I was such a screwed up kid. I had dropped out of high school. I was taking all these drugs and, you know, just full of confusion. And, and all. I was kind of really torn up inside, you know, difficult family life. Right. And, uh, you know, 
I don't, uh, and then I learned to meditate, and it was like someone had turned the light on. Uh, I mean, you said yourself in the beginning of the interview that you noticed quite profound results when you started meditating. And, um, and I still meditate. I mean, I haven't actually missed one since 1968. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, many of the developments that you've been outlining have occurred for me um, in a spontaneous way. I mean, I don't, ident I, I don't feel any sense of seeking anymore, even though I still meditate. But I mean, I used to have this, you know, desperate yearning and craving, and you know, basically clawing at the <laughs> the walls, <laughs> yeah. try to break out. Now I feel primarily free and you know established. And, and if I were to stay this way for the rest of my life, that would be just fine, just the way I am. Um, but nonetheless, nonetheless, it keeps actually getting better. Um, and there, you know, kind of my orientation is that there are degrees of clarity. And there's perhaps no end to the the depth of clarity or that one, that one can appreciate. Uh, and so, would would you agree with that, or would you say that in some sense your way of looking at things is there's a sort of a, a static end to not not only to seeking but to growth once this realization That's, has taken place? That is such a fascinating question. Uh -huh. Such a fascinating question. The thing about the, ex the human experience is that the human experience can always get better and greater. There can be, you can be having more awareness, you can have, be having more bliss, mm -hmm. more this and more that. Or it could get worse. You could have a stroke or something. And, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and I remember that when I was doing, before Sailor Bob got here, mm -hmm. I used to sit in bed every night, you know, when I would sleep, I would start to be with the I am and do this to try to, un to try to, you know, get a sense of the beingness. And every so often I would have an experience in the middle of the night where everything re would recede except for awareness. And it was a blissful experience. It was, it was an experience of being as big as the universe. Mm -hmm. I do not walk around now with an experience of being as big as the universe. Right. But in those experiences, they were incredible. And I thought, you know, from everything I had read about enlightenment, I had thought that that's what enlightenment was, was about, having some grand experience that would be there 24 hours a day. Right. One of those experiences happened when Bob was here, and I went, Bob, oh, I had this great experience. Mm -hmm. said, yeah, yeah. It's, it's an experience. Yeah. It's an ex no big deal, you know. And this was a real eye opener to me. Mm -hmm. And eventually, and it took a while, but eventually, I just stopped caring about experiences because I had what I wanted. Yeah. And I began to understand that I could have more bliss. Maybe, maybe powers are available. Who knows what? But those are not what I was ever really looking for. Even though I thought I was. Mm -hmm. What I was really looking for was to know my true nature. Now I know my true nature. I know who I am and who I'm not. And my my personality and my temperament and my nature is such that I don't particularly care about better this or more this. Mm -hmm. It's not me. In fact, I don't read, you know, people will say, oh, there's a great book on non-duality. There's a great book. For, for my temperament, I'm done. I don't care to read them anymore. Now, there's plenty of other people that have, you know, got the same knowledge I got, and they still enjoy that, and they still enjoy getting more of this and more better experiences. My personality is such that, for me, I'm done. Yeah. I, 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 more than I'm done, what I mean is somebody else could be done, and they could still enjoy more spiritual stuff. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I just enjoy maybe playing music or being with my son. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, look for more experiences now because they come into the category of just come-and-go experiences. Yeah. No, that's that's good. Um, and it's good that you put it that way, too, that this is, for me, the way it is. Exactly. It's you not know, good. Because that. one size does not necessarily fit all, you know, and there are seven billion people in the world, each with their own path and, and each with their own orientation. Um, and, you know, some, you, if you ever get a chance to listen to some of these other interviews I've been doing, you'll see some people that, you know, obviously have a very profoundly established sense of, uh, you know, self-realization, if you, if you don't mind that term, knowing who they are, however you want to put it. Uh, but, there's a, but still they've got this exciting adventure going on where there's all these experiential breakthroughs. 
uh, and discoveries and unfoldments and, and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, that works for them. Some of them meditate, some of them don't meditate. There's, you know, all these different varieties. And I'm, glad, I'm also glad to hear you say that because I, I sort of, in listening to the Urban Guru Cafe things, uh, which gives you a hint about my personality, the fact that I've listened to all 75 of them. <laughs> um, I, uh, I got this sort of bias that kept coming across of, I may be wrong, but there was this, you know, almost every spiritual group in the world has this attitude that our thing is the best and everybody else is somewhat inferior. And I, I, this bias kept coming across in many of the speakers, some of whom were extremely articulate, more so than I could ever hope to be, uh, that, you know, Anybody who talks about levels of development or, you know, any, some guru who is in any way, you know, better, uh, you know, able to realize the self than anybody else or, and so on and so forth is bullshitting you. You know, they're, they're off the track. And um, I, I happen to ascribe to the word paradox. I mean, I, I sort of feel like, yes, I totally agree. The world is an illusion, not real. And on the other hand, there's always the other hand. Uh, it, it is real. I mean, if your son died, that would yes. be, be a very real experience for you. It would be you, a lot of. You wouldn't just brush it off with some philosophical, you know, sleight of hand. It, it would hit you right in the gut, you know. There would there would be a lot of suffering and there would be a lot of grief. Yeah, and and the the, the concept that the world isn't real wouldn't be a, a terrible. It wouldn't be a lot of solace at that point, but it might buffer it. To some extent, there no, there would there still, there would be. First of all, it's all theoretical. Right, <laughs> we're talking about a theoretical, but um, even in those really intense kind of experiences, that knowledge of knowing who you are and knowing who you're not, that knowledge of knowing that the material universe is not real, it's going to be a different experience. Yeah. I mean, it'll be exactly the same as anybody else. You'll suffer your ass off, but it'll also be different in the sense that you'll be experiencing the grief without so much of the of the so much of the psychological stuff that 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 goes on. One of the one of the fascinating things that I realized after Sailor Bob left, and I felt so different, was that you know people would say, "Well, is it different? Is it the same?" I'd say it, it's like it's no different. It's no different than I ever was, and yet it's completely different. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it's just because there's a freedom of the psychological suffering because of the knowledge. It's like you know somebody. Uh, it's almost like you, when you're having a dream at night, and it's real, and it's got you in its grip. And as soon as you realize, sometimes even while you're dreaming, you realize, oh, this is a dream, mm -hmm. and that frees you. It frees you up. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and when you use the word knowledge, I'm sure you use it in a slightly different sense than it's often used by people. Uh, like, you know, a, someone might have a knowledge of chemistry, let's say. Um, and, you know, he could, if you ask him about chemistry, he could tell you a lot of things about it. Um, but, and I suppose that, you know, that knowledge is, is always there, whether or not he evokes it. Um, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily fundamental to everything in his life. You know, it doesn't necessarily have, uh, pertinence to his behavior as a father or or his experience walking down the beach although it may in that case you might think about the chemistry going on at the beach and so on but the, I, I believe and you can you know correct me if I'm wrong the kind of knowledge you're talking about is so essential that you're not you're not just referring to an intellectual concept that you that you sort of grasped as a man might you know study chemistry and 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 learn how to deal with its concepts you're 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 Describing something more visceral that somehow has has kind of seeped into every cell in your in your being, so to speak, and that is it's there regardless of what what life may throw at you. This is this is the most fascinating question because the seekers will say, "I understand it, but it's an intellectual understanding." Yeah, and so I, and so even though I understand I'm not the body and I understand I'm the nothingness, I still don't get it because it's an intellectual understanding. This is fascinating, mm -hmm. because then you say to them, okay, the rainbow that looks like you could touch it, mm -hmm. but you know you can't touch it because it's not physical, right? And they go, yes, I know that. And I say, well, do you know that intellectually, or is it 
a real knowingness? Is it an experiential? And you use the word visceral. It is, it is visceral. At the same time, um, I've thought about this a lot when people will ask, well, how do you know this nothingness? Do you know it intellectually? Or do you feel it or what? And it's fascinating because I talk about the liberation that comes. I, I really hate the word enlightenment because I don't, not that, but... I haven't mentioned uh, it once in this interview for, yeah, the, yeah. for the same reason. <laughs> but when they say, well, is it an... Un I talk about non-duality as an understanding. You must understand who you are and who you're not. Mm -hmm. You must understand that the world is not actually, you know, concrete and physical and, and permanent. And people say, well, is that an understanding or is it an experience? And it turns out that it's both. Mm -hmm. It's both. Now, it's possible for it just to be an intellectual understanding. Yeah. And that's when it doesn't help you very much. Right. The, the, there's no freedom if it's just... And, and, and that's when I say, well, that's where the commitment or the conviction has to come in. And if they say, well, you know, I understand who I am and who I'm not, but there's no conviction, and that's when I say, well, you're not being serious. Mm -hmm. And that's a, it's an odd thing to say, someone who's given up their life and they're seeking this, but something isn't happening with that understanding. They're not, and this is why... Okay, well, so, how does such a person get serious? And I'm sure people have asked you that. You see, I want to be asking, serious, they might say. How do I get yes, serious? Yes, well... In reality, there's nothing that they can do because they're not even here to begin with. It's a dream, mm -hmm. and if they get serious, it's because that's how the dream went. If they don't get serious, it's because that ha that's how the dream went. However, in the world of appearance, you know, I'll talk to them about, about I'll, I'll, I'll use that again, that analogy. Someone put a gun to your head. Which are you going to say is real? Which is not? But, but there's a, there's a, there's something else that I say to people with that question. I say, look, you say you want the truth. You say you want the truth. How badly do you really want it? The truth is given to you, and then you get it, and you don't take it seriously. So I always use the, 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 uh, the explanation of, you, you've probably heard this story, uh, you know, a seeker goes to his guru, and he says, oh, I want enlightenment so badly. He says, come on, let's go in the river. Yeah, hold his head and under. They, holds his head under until the guy can't breathe. Then he lifts his head out and he goes, he's gasping for air. And he says, when you want the truth mm -hmm. that badly, that's when you're ready. Now, this is fascinating because when I finally understood what I understood, it was not at all what I had expected for 35 years. It wasn't bliss. It wasn't powers. It wasn't, wasn't any of the stuff that I thought it was. Right. It wasn't some special walking around. It wasn't that. Right. I had gotten to a point in my life at that point where I wanted the truth more than I wanted an experience, mm -hmm. and I wanted the end to the sense of of separation, okay? Wanting it so badly has something to do within only within the world of appearance, uh -huh. not in reality. Right. In the world of appearance, wanting it that badly when you finally see what it is, you know, you want it that badly, then you take it seriously. You would, you would literally have to want it that badly because when you actually get what you get, it's, it's not at all this flashy, at least for me. Mm -hmm. It's not this really flashy stuff. So if I didn't want it that badly, I'd just discard it and say, well, let me go seeking somewhere else. Right. This is, this is like that, that, that story of, of the guy who goes to the guru and he, <laughs> upon enlightenment, he says, okay, are you ready? I am that. You are that. All of this is that. The guy says, oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> and he goes to the next village. Right. He goes to the guru. He says, I want enlightenment so badly. He says, oh, okay, I can give you enlightenment. That's not hard. What's your background? Where have you been? Well, I went to the guru over there. Oh, you saw that guru? He says, yeah, I did. He says, okay, well, I can help you, but you got to clean toilets for 12 years. <laughs> That's when you'll be ready. Yeah. 12 years goes by, a million to toilet, clean toilets later. Master, the 12 years are up. I'm ready. He says, you ready? I am that. Yeah. <laughs> and he gets it, right? He gets it. Yeah. Because well, that's an interesting point. I mean, there's a Zen <laughs> saying that, um, you know, enlightenment may be accident, may, may just be an accident, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. You know? Yes. And, and, and there's a fascinating thing about people. There are uh, gemologists that, uh, that, 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 that are making, they're growing their own gems. Mm -hmm. And they say, 
that while it's true that it takes a million years for coal to turn into a diamond, I, I thought it was a gradual process. I'm told that it's a million years of pressure on the coal uh -huh. to get it to the point where it's ready. Interesting. And then the diamond occurs within 24 hours. Wow. Yeah. Phase and transition, that, as Marshy always used to put it. You know, I mean, water rises to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, nothing exactly. much happening. All of a sudden, it's boiling. You know? And there's so many that's, examples that's, from science of that kind of thing. That's exactly it. Now, the first thing I said to Sailor Bob was, is it really true the world's not real? I knew that 20 years. Yeah, uh, yeah. When I was 20, I knew that. Uh -huh. 35 years ago. Meant nothing. You hadn't cleaned now, toilets. You had to clean some toilets. That's it. So, <laughs> when, so when I say these people, you're not being serious, it, at the very least, it lets them contemplate, my God, I thought I was serious. What's missing? Yeah. You know, so I'm also glad to hear you saying this stuff because another impression I got from a lot of the um, Urban Guru Cafe folks was that there was a dismissal of spiritual practice as having any value. And it was, you know, this kind of dismissed it. And, and you know, I, I, I disagreed. You know, I, I just feel like, fine, you know, like, well, like the story of Shankara. You know, the king releases the elephant, uh, the elephant's charging at him, Shankara climbs up a tree. King says, hey, if you're so enlightened, why'd you bother climbing the tree? And Shankara says, well, the illusory elephant chased the illusory me up the illusory tree. You know, yeah. But nonetheless, he didn't sat, sit there and get squashed. He climbed the tree. So, you know, fine, you can, you know, you can take the perspective that the whole creation is, a, is an illusion and not real, and therefore spiritual practice is, is silly because what are you doing if the, if the thing isn't real? But it... it well, to use another analogy and finish up my point, you know, Marshi used the analogy of someone standing in the middle of a big mud puddle, and someone co says, well, come out of the mud puddle. And he says, well, how? Well, take a step. Well, wait a minute, you're asking me to put my foot in the mud again. Yeah, but you have to do that, and you have to take a number of steps before you get to the edge of the mud puddle, then you'll be out. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. The, the, thing about, the thing about them saying you know, s spiritual paths aren't necessary. It, it's not like, it's not that one is right and one is wrong. They're just, they're just different. And um, a lot of times when they say no, that spiritual practice is not necessary, they're speaking more, more from an absolutist point of view. Yeah. Um, some, sometimes. And um, the other thing is that there's, there's a few things that I've noticed. One, People that get the understanding of non-duality usually have done some practice. It's, they, I mean, the statistics from what I've seen are that most of them have been at it for a long time and they've been doing that. Not everyone, but most. Right. And secondly, there's another, when it comes, now there's different paths. Non-duality is, Advaita or non-duality is a particular path. It's mm -hmm. a, a non-path path. You don't do anything. However, um, um, the people that get non-duality are far more likely to be the ones that are looking for the truth of what's real and they're looking for who am I really Yeah. the people that are looking for an experience mm -hmm. very rarely get Advaita they may get enlightened or something at some point or they may get liberation or some great experience but as far as getting non-duality, because non-duality is this thing where we're not talking about experiences, we're talking about just understanding right. who you are and who you're not. Yep. A person who's looking for bliss or powers, you tell them, you know, you, you give them this understanding, you point them in the direction of who they are and who they're not. It's not satisfying experience at all. Right. Okay. It does, to some extent, after the understanding is there, they may have some experience, but... Mm. If they're after experience and you're pointing them to the truth of who they are, they often don't get it. Yeah, but you know, but people's orientation matures, I think, very often, hopefully. Uh, you know, a little kid, he wants a tricycle. Then maybe within a little older, he wants a bicycle. Then later on, he wants a little go-kart. And, you know, at a certain stage, he wants a car. Uh, and, you know, his, his desires mature as he matures. And, uh, you know, people start out 
with meditation, let's say, and they think, whoa, I had such a great meditation. Now, enlightenment must be where I have that kind of experience all the time. I'm just like practically unable to walk. I'm so blissful, you know, and they kind of look for that to happen more and more often. But, you know, and I've, I've been there in terms of my understanding and experience. But, you know, then later on, they, re, they, they as they be mature spiritually, they become kind of ripe for the realization that, no, it's not just some flash in the pan thing like that. It's It's something much more non-flashy and natural and, and perhaps subtle and, and, and certainly continuous. Um, and so they kind of, it's like a stepping stones, you know, you kind of step up to that in many cases. So I don't necessarily feel that somebody who's, but, but you know, to, to play devil's advocate to myself, I mean, there are a lot of people in Fairfield um, who have been meditating 30, 40 years, and I, I don't think that they've undergone that shift in understanding, you know, that's still like, you know, oh, I had this cool experience during my meditation, and and I and I'd like to have that that experience become permanent. And in fact, there's a certain in this town, there's a certain um, attitude in, among some people towards those who claim to have a, an abiding realization that they must be self-deluded or, uh, you know, on some kind of ego trip or something because they don't they can't fly or they 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 don't seem to have the kind of you know, spiritual pizzazz that Maharishi had, or something like that, and and there's this sort of attitude that well, that's where what real enlightenment is, the ability to perform these miraculous things, or to sort of wow people with your darshan, um, and a regular schmo like you, so and so, you know, must not be genuinely self-realized because he seems so ordinary, you know. Yeah. Um... The thing is that that uh, uh, what what you mainly what you mainly want is is the freedom from the bondage or the freedom from from a you know a sense of, of uh, you know separation or something like uh-huh. that. Um, but um, I was going to say something else, but I uh, well, let me tell oh, you. Know, oh, go ahead. Know, yeah, go ahead. I, I know what. It, yeah. Uh, this is something that I mentioned on the on the Urban Guru Cafe. Um, people will tell you about you know Guru so and so who is so enlightened, and this other Guru who's even more enlightened, and and this other Guru who, you know Guru who's even more enlightened. <laughs> but here's the thing: when people are looking for you know one particular you know thing that criteria that proves enlightenment, you know, or something like that. This is where it gets hairy. There really is no enlightenment because there never was any real, you know, uh, uh, bondage. However, Uh however, the idea of enlightenment is losing the false reference point. That's the major idea. The false reference point would be that I am James. Yeah. Well, that's that's just false. My body's going to come and go. James is going to come and go. So the idea of gaining enlightenment is losing that, that, you know, like Nisargadatta said, as long as you believe you're a person, you will suffer mm-hmm. because things mm-hmm. will happen to you that you don't like. Right. And you'll be suffering. If something happens and, and you say, but who is it really happening to? You realize it's not happening to anybody. It may not feel good, but at least you understand, you know. Yeah. So here's the thing. For the people that believe that there's somebody who has something that they don't, okay, you can always find that no matter what guru or God or Shiva or Krishna – no matter who it is, that false reference point never goes away mm-hmm. until the body mm-hmm. goes away and the mind and the, and the appearance of the body, the appearance, until that goes away, that false reference point is there. You just, not, you just have to know how to get to it. Mm-hmm. So you may be with a guru and they take his money, he says, I don't care. You know, uh, he's sick, oh, I don't care. But if you press the right button, you'll see his false reference point. You go and mm-hmm. you, the analogy I always use is, you go to your Krishna or Shiva or, you know, Nisargadatta or whoever it is, and you say, look, I'm a killer. That's my nature. I like to kill people. I have to kill someone today. I, I just have to do it. I can kill someone in the next village, or I can kill your loved one. You choose. Mm-hmm. Now, if the guru says, yeah, go ahead, kill my loved one, he's crazy. He's a lunatic. Right. If somebody, it, when I was 20, you know, when I was younger, I didn't really analyze this enlightenment stuff well enough, and most people don't. 
you, you think that it's going to get you to a state of no suffering mm -hmm. and perfection and, and no reference. Mm -hmm. But if you were that, you would be a zombie. Right. Somebody uh -huh. said, if, if you go to a guru and say, hey, I got a dirty bomb, I'm going to explode it in New York City, or I can throw it in the ocean, they're going to choose the ocean. Right. They're doing that from a reference point. And therefore, that's the, and that's the reason why I, I have no, I don't have any more envy or, or oh, this person can do that, and this person's got this. Mm -hmm. Because it's all, it's just, we're all ultimately the same. And those little tricks, or those little abilities or whatever, they're meaningless. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, mm -hmm. there's nobody that doesn't have that false reference point, the same as I do, the same as everybody. That's a very good point. And you know, and you could think of many other examples. I mean, you could give the the most enlightened person in the world a, a plate of dog poop and, and a pl I, and a delicious I, meal. They're going to take the delicious yeah. meal. Obviously, they they can dis they they make choices. They distinguish. They have opinions. They have attitudes. They have preferences and blah blah blah. You know, they're human beings. That's right. And 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 that's the reason. You know, it used to drive me nuts. So many of the gurus that I that I saw. They would get embroiled in money. They would get embroiled in sex scandals and power scandals. All these crazy. And I said, why is this? It's because they also have a false reference point that that's going to give them desires. Yeah, and that may give them prostate cancer or whatever. There's there's a personality that that has these things and that suffers from them. Yep. Um, you know, one one way analogy I like to use in, in thinking of all this is that you know if we think of the the you know, reality itself, the essential nature of, of everything as being like electricity. And then you have different bulbs, you know, right. a 20 watt bulb, 100 watt bulb, big lighthouse bulb, and so on. And they're all drawing off the same electrical field. And that electrical field isn't different for any of them. But some bulbs shine more brightly than others. And some might have different colors, and, and some may burn out and die. But the, the electrical field remains what it is. You know, so I'd, I'd say that a you know a big famous guru, some of them at least, you know, they they happen to be pretty bright bulbs. They can they can sort of like uh, ch you know r channel or reflect or express a great deal of that electricity, so to speak. Um, and others, you know, not so much. But it doesn't mean that uh, you know in in the ultimate sense, you know, one is more enlightened than the others, unless we define enlightenment as meaning the ability to channel or express, as opposed to the ability to just realize one's essential nature. Yeah, well, I would, I, I would even go to the thief in the prison. He's just as enlightened as well. Yeah, but whether it's he knows it or not is, right. is an no, important we, matter. He has no idea. Yeah. Of, he actually feels like he's suffering, and he feels like he's in bondage and all that, but ultimately the reality is the guru, no matter how great the guru is, mm -hmm. he's got a false reference point just like the thief. Yeah. It, certainly, the person who's br you know shining brightly is having a much more graceful life. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's like... Um, and the thief in the prison may not realize he has a false reference point. He thinks his reference point is real, and, and, and he's, you know, really upset about being in that prison. Whereas, you know, you might take an enlightened, so, uh, pardon me for using the word, but <laughs> a, a realized person or whatever, put them in the same prison, and they might be cool with it, you know? I mean, they might, not, they might not rather be, they'd rather be somewhere else, but as long as they're there, they, it doesn't grip them to the same extent. In fact, Ed Beckley, whom you may know, wrote a book about his experience of awakening in prison, and, you know, he said some people there, it was hell for them, because they, they were... They had no sense of of sort of self awareness or, or inner freedom, and every day was a nightmare. Others, the experience had actually sort of brought them into a, a state of living in the moment, as you were speaking of early earlier, where they just absolutely took each moment as it came. They didn't think I have to be here 20 more years. It was like now and now and now. And he said those people were quite happy. Yeah, yeah, that's that's. That's great, great, uh, great stuff. Yeah, I know Ed. He's, he's, we talked about this stuff. He's down in your area, isn't he? Same yeah. place. Yeah. I want to interview him one of these days. <clears throat> so, what haven't we covered? Uh, 
One thing, I, well, pertinent to our discussion, uh, I think you can ultimately trace, if you have a lineage, you could trace it back to Ramana Maharshi in a sense, because there's Sailor Bob, and then he was with Nsargadatta, and he was with Ramana Maharshi, was he not? Or maybe he was with, with Ramesh Balkasar, no. and he was with the Mah Ramana Maharshi. No, they, 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 they had a different guru. Did they? It wasn't, it wasn't Ramana, but, you know, it's... it's anyway, it doesn't matter. They'd, they'd all respect him. But one interesting thing that someone... Um, told me about that Ramana apparently would say when people came to him and it, it sort of harkens back to something you were saying earlier was at first he would give them a, a Mahavakya he would say something like thou art that you know and maybe they would get it but mostly mostly people wouldn't and so he'd say okay well then uh, you know do self-inquiry you know like the kind of thing you were saying that you sat in bed and did every night where you you know right the I am who am I what am I and if that didn't work for him, you say, okay, well, practice meditation. Do that. Take, he'd take him a step back. And, and then, but if they couldn't even sit to meditate, you say, well, do service. You know, just get out there and help people. And uh, Shankara says something like this, too, in his writings, that um, these stages are, are sort of, you'd, you'd, well, there's a verse from the Gita. Because one can perform at one's own dharma, the lesser in merit is better than the dharma of another. Better is death in one's own dharma. The dharma of another brings danger. And so I think the idea is you do what you're suited to do, and that may change over time. You know, the, the, the service guy may get to the point where he can sit and meditate, and the meditating guy may do, get to the point where he can do self-inquiry, just as you went through those two stages. And then that guy may eventually get a mahavakya, <clears throat> thou art that, and ta-da, you know, he, yeah. gets, he gets it. Yeah. So there is this sort of progressive nature, I think, to development. Uh, and uh, I think the reason I'm dwelling on it so much is, is I didn't get the sense, again, in listening to all these urban guru people, that they really appreciated that. You know, they, they kept... The growth? Yeah, the growth thing. In fact, I was listening to a... a there's a, a verse from the Isha Upanishad which says something like, um, those who are devoted to avidya go into blinding darkness. But, in, but into greater, even greater darkness goes the, go those who are devoted to, to vidya. And avidya means ignorance, vidya means knowledge. And I don't really know what the writer of that verse intended, but to me it sort of means, you know, if you just sort of are totally stuck in the relative, that's suffering. But if, you, if you're kind of uh, oriented to the absolute to the point that you dismiss the relative entirely, and, um, you know, like you we were saying earlier, you, you you kind of deny that you have preferences or that people should have preferences or that there can be stages of growth and so on and so forth. That's also a lopsided view. It's, it's kind of like paradoxical as it may be, both perspectives are true and they kind of fit into a larger whole. Do you agree with that? It's kind of a long rambling. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no, I do. But the thing is that there's no, from my side, I don't, I can't speak for the other people. From my side, it's purely... Once you understand who you are and who you're not, and once you understand that the whole experience that you're having is something that's transitory, it, it will largely depend on your nature as to whether you consider the growth to be of any value. Uh -huh. I have uh -huh. always been a goal-oriented person. I, that's just the way I am. I would do something until I get to the end of it, and then I say, you know what, I'm done with this. Mm -hmm. That's just my nature. Mm. And so once I understood, once I understood that, that no matter how much, how brighter the bulb would get, the essential freedom is here. How bright the bulb gets is irrelevant to me. Uh -huh. That's my nature. Mm -hmm. That's my nature. Now, there are people who, who understand it, who get it, they, they, they are free, and they prefer to have more growth, more gr now. Now, when you say more growth, that's a rel I mean relative growth on the relative level. Yeah, yeah. Once because that's the only thing that can grow. Right. Well, <laughs> well, the thing is, once they understand that they're not the body and thoughts and the feelings, mm -hmm. there's no more growth to take place in terms of the understanding of their of uh, well, I don't know. That's hard to say <laughs> because the bulb will burn brighter, but but. You know, people would always ask, ask Sailor Bob, is there a deepening? You've been with this 30 years. Is there a deepening? Mm -hmm. And he would have to answer, you know, he prefers to answer from the level, from the ultimate level and say, no, there is no deepening, ultimately. Because once you're realized, you're realized. 
And yet, of course, and then he'll say, but of, of course, my experience isn't the same now that I've been with non-duality for 20 years. It, it grows, but there, for some people, there's a preference to have that more of that growth. And for others, that's it, done. Yeah. It depends on the nature only. So it may be that the people on that, on the, uh, on the urban guru, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to say why so many of them, I think so many of them will talk against growth, possibly because they, they are feeling that it will keep a person seeking. Yeah. I, and the more you seek, the further away you are from what, where you want to be. Yeah. Now that's seeking. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between seeking and seeking and seeking as if when I get this better experience, then I'll be something. Mm -hmm. That's not so good yeah. in, the, in what they're trying to teach. So I think when, when they hear that stuff, they, they immediately want to deny it and, you know, and say, don't do that, that's no good, blah, blah, blah. But as long as you understand the true nature, go and have a field day. Yeah, I think you may be right. That might be why they have that emphasis. Um, most of them, most of them definitely do. If, if a seeker, because if a seeker, see, when you talk to them, you know, you're, you're, you're not a seeker, seeker. When a seeker comes, I'm talking about a person who says, I'm in bondage and suffering, I want freedom. The last thing on earth they want to do as teachers is say, and when you get this, there'll be deepening and deepening. Right, and right. They don't want to say that. It doesn't do them any good. Yeah. No, good, this, good point. This is, this is really an important point. This is really an important point. One of the reasons that I really, really am thankful that I found Sailor Bob, as opposed to many of the other non-duality teachers, is that many of them will say that there is a final understanding, hmm. at which point this drops off and that drops off and this drops off, and it's a final understanding. This to me is a bunch of crap, total crap, God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> this to me is, is really nonsense, you know, that there's some final understanding. That, that is, first of all, most of the times that's coming from teachers that basically want to have people still coming to them and getting more money. At least that's my, that's my perception of it. Because if you take one of these people who says that they have the final understanding, they're no longer John or they're no longer, you know, the star, you know, Maharaj or whatever, you know, I'll find their reference point real, real quick. Mm -hmm. You know, want me to, want me to take, uh, you know, uh, a nice you know, can of sewage and throw it in your house? Yeah. Because they say, no, I said, oh, there's his reference point. I think you that's know, so one of the I, reasons the Zen masters would have a stick in hand, you know? Yeah. You, you think you're not anybody? Whack, how's that feel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a great point. <laughs> huh. I was thinking about the, the growth thing that we were talking about a minute ago and, and whether it's a preference or not. And... Um, I sort of think in in my wait wait, wait. I'm, I'm sorry go ahead what when you say whether it's a preference whether mean, the desire to you know continue oh. growing or whether just to rest on one's laurels and, and enjoy that state and not be so preoccupied with further development and growth and so on it's a, a personal preference as you were saying um, but on the other hand and there's always another hand um, the uh, there's a sort of yeah there's a sort of, maybe even four there's there's a, an evolutionary force uh, that I think you know has been functioning since probably eternal eternity but in this universe for 13.7 billion years uh, you know giving rise to stars and planets and eventually forms of life and there seems to be a a sort of a, an impetus or a, a direction. Um, to achieve greater and greater expressions of complexity and uh, and capacity for self-awareness, and uh, I'm not sure that we can ever uh, divorce ourselves from that force, that we can ever be immune to it, or uh, you know not still guided by it. We may not feel it acutely as a sort of a driving personal imperative, but at the same time, I think it's nonetheless 
carrying us along. Maybe it's like a river, you know, the river is flowing, and we can choose to just sort of float and go with the flow of the river, or we can swim along and maybe move down the river a little bit faster than the guy who's floating, but nonetheless we're still moving along, uh, carried by this current of, you know, evolutionary, whatever you want to call it. Right. And, and to that I would say what you're describing is something that you've noticed happens within the dream. Mm -hmm. So if tomorrow that doesn't happen, that you know that wouldn't shock me, right? Because that would be how the dream is going. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take anything within the relative to be too absolute, or having any any great reality to it. If it if suddenly gra you know if 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 tomorrow gravity changes and there's no more gravity, mm -hmm. that would be how the dream goes. That's yeah, how the, true. That's how the dream goes, you know. And and for some people, you know, when I say it's a preference, that's the same as saying for some people, um, you know, uh, the dream will go in that direction where they want more and more and more. And for other people, the dream will go in a different direction. Uh, or they can have, you know, they can. There, there was one, I think it was a TM woman, had these really flashy enlightenment experiences, but she also had a brain tumor. Oh yeah, that's yeah. Uh, Suzanne Siegel. Right, and then and then suddenly life wasn't, you know. Toward the end of her life, I think life wasn't going in, in, in the, the light bulb wasn't getting brighter; it was getting dimmer. Sure, you know. So that's just how the dream went. And that'll happen to all of us in one way or another. Yeah, we're all headed for a crash landing. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there are certain uh, features which seem to be characteristic of everyone's dream. You know, we none of us are exempt from gravity. None of us are exempt from dying. None of us are, you know, I mean, photosynthesis seems to happen to all plants, regardless of their dream. Uh, and, you know, we all need to eat, you know, there's so on and so forth. There's certain laws of nature. Uh, we all have hearts that need to beat if we're going to stay alive. There are certain laws of nature which seem to be irrevocable. Um, and, um, you know, ultimately we can analyze it all as an illusion, but the illusion is quite marvelous and, and set up with, some so with apparently uh, you know unfathomable creativity and intelligence. I mean, anywhere you look, from the you know cosmological perspective, looking out through telescopes to the you know, microscopic level, there's you know something marvelous happening. Uh, and you know you can analyze it down to its very essence and say, okay, that's that the essence is really all it is. There is no manifestation. There is no universe. But um, that wouldn't be the whole story because. You agree? <laughs> <laughs> it's really kind of a loaded subject, I think, because um, the way the dream goes over here mm -hmm. is that you've described something. I'm not going to argue it, you know, but how, how the dream is going over here mm -hmm. is that to me, that's, I wouldn't place much. It's a dream. It's it's like you were just what you just described. Yeah, is like me talking about. Uh, I had this dream last night in the baseball stadium, and the Braves won, and it was five two. You mm know, -hmm. and 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 you know, if I was describing that dream to somebody of the baseball game that I had in the middle of the night, I wouldn't get too caught up in it because it's yeah. a dream. So, um, you know, what the, the 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 stuff that you're talking about, I would guess that if you talk much about that with non-dualists or urban guru cafe they're going to they're want they're going to want to go oh get out of here yeah. and part of it part of that i mean the fact that you i think you're right that it is part of the story the dream appeared to occur but most people that have finally gotten to the point where they you know figured out that it's a dream they want to go <sighs> enough of the dream yeah okay so rick wants to talk about the dream and the gravity and those are, enough of that no, I had enough of that. Now I want to talk about how I know it's a dream, you know. Yeah, but I, I agree with you. And and but there are there is still even the people who do the Urban Guru Cafe, they put a whole lot of effort and time and money perhaps into, you know, telling that story and getting it exactly. out there to the world. Exactly. And all the gurus, you know, who you know, let's say of the whole subset of totally genuine gurus who have ever lived, uh, you know, they know it's a dream, but they dedicate their lives to getting yeah. out there and and yeah. helping other people wake up from it, yeah. or or you know feel to to eliminate their suffering. 
Yeah. So it's not like they just sort of, maybe some of them do. I mean, there are some who are content, it's a dream, I'm staying in the cave, you know. But others feel this motivation. And, uh, uh, see, and, when I, you know, one of the things I said earlier on was that when I was searching, when I was searching, I thought if I ever got to the end of it, I would be beating down doors to tell people about it. Yeah. But the, you know, how the dream works over here right. is that it is glaring to me. It stares me in the face every day that the whole thing is a dream. Mm -hmm. And so the only way, the only way that there's an impetus for me to help somebody with non-duality is if they come looking for it. Right. Because other than that, it's really too absurd. These people that think they're suffering aren't even really here, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, the whole idea, now this is not reality, but this is going to be a, a theoretical explanation, but the whole idea of the existence is that the oneness, consciousness or oneness or emptiness, it's just one, mm -hmm. boring. So it, it, it appears to manifest this great whole creation. So why would I want to go and take somebody's dream away? Unless they it's, wanted it to be. Unless they wanted it, and then yeah. I'm thrilled to do it, because I know in the world of appearance, I know that they're going to be freer yep. and happier. Okay, but but I would never I would never go out and seek to change somebody to make them hear this unless they were searching for it, partly because the emptiness manifested in order to have duality. Yeah. Why yeah. should I take that duality away from people unless they're looking for it? But that's that's my nature, or that's how the dream goes over here. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people that they want to spread it like crazy. Mm -hmm. And even mm -hmm. them, even they, don't have much success except with those who are looking for it. <laughs> you know, cast ye not your pearls before swine. I, uh, <coughs> yeah. You know, unless there's some kind of motivation. You can't foist it on people. It's hard enough when there is motivation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's simple, but it's not easy. Right. It's simple, it's simple message, but not easy for people. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. <laughs> Ed Beckley was, was here one day. He had, um, he had a group with, I don't know, 10 or 15 people. And he'd been with them, you know, for a couple of years, mm -hmm. right? And so, the, and, and so he, he says, my group wants to come and see you. I said, okay, great. But I'm thinking, why do they want to come see me? He's telling them the same thing, right. you know. So I, I give this talk, and it happened to be a really good one. You know, sometimes you have a good one, sometimes yeah, you yeah. Don't. Sometimes you're really on. I was really on, and when I was done, the hands went up. How do I live a better life? How do I make this happen? <laughs> I just told you there is no you. It's, you know, and, and 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 I was I was really perplexed. This is early on when I first started teaching, and Ed came up to me later on. He said, "Listen." Some people are going to be, they're going to keep having the same questions over and over. And then one day, they just say, they suddenly get it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, those so. might be valid questions, but you're not the guy to ask them of. I mean, you know, you trade, you know, gold stocks or something, you said. And I'm sure you, you like to trade them successfully. You know, you, you, you prefer to make money doing that yes. rather than lose. And maybe there are, you know, there are people you can learn from who teach you how to do that better and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, so if that's what you want, you go to one of those people. Yes. You know, so how do I live a better life? I'm, there's all kinds of life yeah. coaches and people who right. teach that kind of yeah, stuff. No, but that, there, that's uh, not what you're not the guy to see about that. No, yeah. I just told them that there is no you. Right. My job is to my job. You know, you want to find out that stuff first. Get this message that there is no you, and then worry about that stuff. Yeah. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all else should be added. You know. And I mean, you know, Shankar might have been able to take lessons in tree climbing. You know, it, was, it, it might have helped him. Uh, so it's not to say that, uh, you know, no matter what one's uh, conviction that the world is an illusion, there is, there might not still be the motivation to uh, acquire more relative skills in it that benefit one's. How, how did you put it? One's. Uh, you had a, an interesting way of referring to the individuality. Um, uh, False reference point? Yeah, false reference point. Right. Um, you know, we like our false reference points to be enhanced as much as possible within reason. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. And <laughs> and the other false reference points that our false reference point is devoted to and associated with. 
Yeah. You know? <laughs> the preferences. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's got their preferences, and that's a, that never goes away. No, you know? I don't think it does. But there's, but, but there's not so much of a... You know, it's, it's really fascinating to me. I had always heard that when you die, you would see your life before you, you know, not with emotion, but just kind of objectively, mm -hmm. and then a desire would pop up. Hmm. You know, a desire would pop up. And that's what would bring you into the next life. Right. And supposedly, if you gain liberation, you don't. That doesn't happen. You don't. There's no desire at the end. Mm -hmm. You know. And and it's very interesting because I had desires before. I have desires now. But the difference is, none of them can make a difference. In other words, I now understand that it, it doesn't make a difference in reality whether you know a person you know, does some great thing or becomes famous or powerful or wealthy or enlightened. None of that stuff make, makes, makes a difference. So I have no doubt that I have desires going on all the time, but none of them are strong mm. like they used to be. They used to be, I have to do this or, you know, that's yeah. that kind of desire. The attachment isn't there. Right. Yep. And that's an important point, too, because there are so many spiritual teachings that are misinterpreted as killing desire or getting rid of desire or not having right. any desires and right. I don't think that's possible if you're no. gonna, if you're going to be alive it makes no sense <laughs> and uh, but I think what all those teachings were actually pointing to is what you just described yeah the desire there's constant desire and there's no desires you yeah. know it's, 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 um, I remember that when 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 sailor bob had been here for 5 weeks and I, it was it was really you know, 12 hours a day of non-duality. Mm -hmm. And then I started writing my book, mm -hmm. you know, and I was, I was just steeped in it for months. And, and, and I remember that, you know, I would have desires, but instead of even acting on them, I'd say, well, what's the point of acting on that? But they would be there, but I'd say, you know, it's not necessary that I act on this. And it was fascinating. What started to occur was that so many desires got fulfilled anyway. Mm. Uh, trying and then other desires I noticed that there were desires that I had that I didn't get and then I realized later if I'd gotten them it would have gotten in the way of things mm -hmm. one night one night I went to this party and uh, uh, there was one of the other people that had been around a lot with the non-duality groups he was at that party as well I sat down I was next to this woman who had had a lot of a lot to drink I think mm. And we were talking, and she said, how many children do you have? And I said, I, I, said, I have one, and he's a handful. <laughs> Whatever I said, set this woman off. Mm -hmm. right? and she kept, kept, you know, complaining or, you know, throwing barbs at me. And, I, you know, and finally I'm thinking, am I going to have to say something to this woman? And I said, <laughs> oh, I, no. I, I, you know, it, it, and it was, it was in the same realm of it's just another desire. Right. And it was so funny because... Um, you know, as it got stronger, I thought, you know, maybe I need to say something to this woman. And then Dell, who had been in the non-duality groups, he comes over and he hears this woman say something. And he immediately said, lady, what's the matter with you? And he just, you know, he did what I would have done. Did it for you. Yeah, but I just, I, you know, I didn't want to act on the desire. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because, I mean, I'll, I'll re you know, reiterate what you just said. You said that more, you began to find once this inner freedom had dawned that, desires were getting fulfilled more readily and right. and desires which ought not to be fulfilled weren't getting fulfilled and some something was sorting all that out <laughs> so you know what do you think was the agency or is the agency now for the you know the fulfillment of those legitimate desires and the thwarting of the uh, of the inappropriate ones who's who's doing that for you I want to answer that from the point of view of the whole thing's a dream, and it's, it's just the way it's happening. Yeah, but interestingly, there, the, the dream no, has has been upgraded to a better dream, and, and yeah, there's I some know. kind of instrumentality that's that's conducting it. All I can say is that that I don't know how to say it. I mean, you could use TM language. You know, you start to get you start to get in tune with nature. Mm -hmm starts to be less grabbing and clawing and desperation. I mean, the thing really ultimately I think that it is, is that when you understand that there is no you, mm -hmm. when I, you know, there is no individual here, 
when it's understood that there's no individual that is actually here, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I don't know. With the next sentence to say, uh, you're more in tune with the oneness. You are more of the oneness. I don't know, but mm. but all the resistance, the resistance within the dream, it just disappears. You know, um, Adi Shankara, who lived a couple thousand years ago, was really the grandpappy of Advaita. He's the guy who's generally acknowledged as the founder of that you know, branch of Vedic uh, knowledge. And uh, he was a great exponent of it. I mean, he wrote you know, commentaries on the Upanishads and the Brahma Sutras when he was just in his early teens and so on. Um, but on the other hand, he was a great... Uh, devotee of God, he wrote Bhaja Govindam. He he wrote you know these devotional, beautiful devotional poetry and so on and so forth. And uh, there's a, a saying of his which is that the intellect imagines duality for the sake of devotion. Say it again. The intellect imagines duality for the sake of devotion. Um, so I mean, this guy was no slouch. He he understood his Advaita. <laughs> he had it down. But on the other hand, you know, he he, has, he was actually a devotee of God. He he acknowledged, at least for the sake of devotion, he he acknowledged the existence of God of a, of a divine intelligence, and and he engaged in devotion to that. I, I don't want to say entity to to that level of reality or whatever, and uh, you know what I'm kind of getting at here is perhaps that uh, that which fulfills your desires for you and thwarts your negative ones or your inappropriate ones is that greater intelligence you know that people have referred to as god but you know which could be understood in in a deeper sense or in different in, a, in other terminology you know that illusory as the universe may be something seems to have created it and given rise to it and perhaps that something has greater play in one's life once the individuality kind of gets out of the way and, and is realized for the, the ephemeral thing that it is, uh, you know, something else can can uh, play a hand in our destiny much more effectively once we st stop interfering. Yeah, I, that's that's beautiful. I, that's exactly what I think. That's exactly what it is. The oneness is somehow enjoying itself better when you get out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. When the, Oneness is enjoying itself when the dream of oneness, you know, when the when the when the illusion of duality, you know, sees through itself. It's it's kind of like oneness seeing through itself. Yeah. Because the oneness has made this illusion, mm -hmm. and then the oneness sees, oh, it's an illusion, and so it plays better. It, it's yeah. It's like a better functioning automobile. It just it functions better. It plays hide and seek with itself. It's like you were saying earlier. Yeah. It, it was kind of bored being just flat oneness. And so, hey, let's create a universe. And then, oops, I'm, you know, then it seems to get lost in the universe. You know, all these little manifestations don't, don't, uh, from their perspective, don't appreciate that which has given rise to it all. Uh, but then, at a certain point, the manifestations become sophisticated enough in their in their functioning that that, that it can dawn on them. Wait a minute, I am that. Who started this game, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and while I've, you know, the hide and seek game kind of comes to its fruition, yeah. at least as far as that expression yeah. is concerned. Yeah, I, I think that's what happens. Huh. And 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 that's the area I think in which there's greater capacity for growth, greater capacity for unfoldment of appreciation of you know that. How can I put it? That in, that intelligence that um, has brought about this whole marvelous turn of events, you know. Mm. But I'm speaking somewhat intuitively and speculatively, speculatively myself here. It just it just seems to to kind of strike a chord with me. Yeah, yeah, I can I can see. Some people enjoy. I, I have one friend understands everything, but he reads Ramana, knows who he is, mm -hmm. knows who he's not. But he reads Ramana, and and he hears about you know he reads that Ramana had this great state of calmness and this great and so he wants that, and that's important and significant he you know, and to me it's garbage. Hmm. I, I don't mean garbage 
in, oh, it's a bad thing. I don't mean that. I was just, who cares? You mean, like, you mean Ramana Maharshi, that Ramana? Uh, Ramana Maharshi. Yeah, the, the guy in, in uh, yeah. Tiruvanna Malai who just, yeah. just kind of sat yeah. around the mountain. Yeah. Uh, my, my friend reads his stuff and he reads how, oh, you reach this great state of equanimity and you, re you know, and all that stuff. And, and for that person, you know, my friend knows who he is and he knows who he's not. Yeah. But he thinks that some of the stuff that, you know, that, that Ramana Maharshi is talking about is really important and significant and fine, go knock yourself out. But for me, it doesn't mean anything. There's a friend of uh, a friend of mine who at, in her little email signature, she has this quote which says, be yourself, every other role is taken. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I would suggest to your friend that he's never going to become R R Ramana, you know. Yeah. And, I mean, that guy had his own personality and his own dharma, his own personal qualities. But, you, you know, your friend can certainly become uh, you know more vividly who he is, perhaps. You know, uh, enjoy the, the unfoldment of that. Well, I also have I, that, that, that's that's definitely perfect. I, I it's like I know my own personality well enough to know that you know that's just the way I am. I don't. Yeah. You know, but uh, I, you know, there was a friend that I had. It was he was a TM person, and he read my book, and and we've known each other for years. And he said, well, yeah, I, I, you know, I I see that, and I see that, but I want. I want powers, or I want, you know, so he want. I said, well, go and keep doing, keep searching. Yeah, get them. <laughs> and about a year later, he came back and he said, you, you know what, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we're done. Are we done? Is there anything we haven't really brought up that uh... I've, I've said the stuff that I said most of the stuff that usually comes up with seekers. Uh -huh. the, the, uh, there, there's 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 one other thing that 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 is worth knowing, I think, for some people, for seekers specifically for for seekers, I get I get a, a lot of people who you know seeking for a long time. They read my book and it's they, they, oh my god, you know I really got it. I got it. they call me and they're all excited. And I said now listen, it's going to come a point. Most likely, if you're like most of the people, a month or two down the road, you're going to say oh I'm suffering. I lost it. Right. You know. And let me tell you that. Suffering will occur. Some shit will happen. It doesn't mean you've lost anything. You know, it, this is this is what life is. As long as you remember who you are and who you're not, mm -hmm. you know, and and that there's a conviction there, mm -hmm. so that, you know, I mean, the point is that. Well, I'll just tell you a story. When Sailor Bob was here, um, you know, somebody did something. That he didn't like, and all of a sudden, he, you know, his temper just flared, you know, and then, and then he just immediately apologized. Right. And that was it. You know, it wasn't mm. like so. His reference point came out, but that was the mm. end of it. Yeah. You know, he, did, he wasn't suffering. Oh my God. Oh, I lost it because I said this to this person. Mm -hmm. I like that. It's That's like the just, old Zen story. You know, the story of the yeah. two, the, the older monk and the younger monk, and they they they're walking along the road, and they come to a stream, and there's this beautiful young girl standing, and she can't get across the stream. And the older monk picks up the girl, and they walk across the stream, and he puts her down, and they keep on walking. And several hours later, the younger monk can't contain himself, and he said, "What did you do? You know, you're you're a monk. You're not supposed to pick. You're not supposed to touch women." And the older monk says, "Oh, are you still carrying her? I put her down on the other side of the stream." <laughs> yeah, exactly. But people think because they get real excited about, "Oh, I, I I know who I am. I know." They get real excited, and then when they have some suffering, they think they've lost it. Yeah. There's nothing is lost. I could recommend a book to such people. Um, it's by a guy named Adyashanti, whom you may have heard of, and the book is called The End of Your World. And it's specifically written for people, who, uh, although others could enjoy it, but it's specifically written for people who have had a spiritual awakening. And it, it discusses in a very systematic way all the sort of things one might encounter after that initial awakening. And one of the chapters is the I got it, I lost it syndrome. Right. You know, right. he, he addresses that very eloquently. Adyashanti.org is his website, and yeah. you can get the book there. I met him uh, at one of the astrological conferences that I was there. Mm -hmm. Somebody had brought him uh, to give a lecture. He was great. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, that might be a good stopping point. Um, what I'm going to do is I will I'll have this up on a website, and people can, you know, people who are accustomed to coming there will be listening to it and downloading it, and it'll also be on YouTube. And uh, we'll have a little, you, you can send me a photo of yourself and a little biographical 
couple hundred words that you'd like to have there. And uh, we'll include links to anything you want. So a link to your website, a link to Sailor Bob's website, or whatever, okay. whatever else you'd like to have. How many of these do you have? Oh, I think you are number 21 or 22. Oh. I think you're 22. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I do them about once a week. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. That's neat. And uh, the, the website is, uh, in case someone is, and actually this will also be on the local public access TV station here in Fairfield. Uh, and and so if you're watching it on, on that or list, looking at it on YouTube, the website I'm referring to is is called batgap.com. B a t g a p. Oh, I see. Which that. is an acronym for Buddha at the gas pump, and uh, so you can go there and you see them all archived. And then there are links to the YouTube channel and the, the, there's a chat group where people are chattering about this kind of stuff all all day long and and uh, different resources like that. That's great. Yeah. And so when we're finished here, there'll be some titles that'll roll also, and it'll have, in the credits, it'll have a reference to that, batgap.com, and, and a few other things. Mm. And, uh, and as I said, we'll, on, the, on that site, we'll link to your website if people want to contact you, either for you know, spiritual discussion like this, or for you know, astrological services, or whatever. Mm. Okay. And say hi to Ed for me, and tell him I'll... Uh, Okay. I'll do him as soon as he likes. I, I, I'm kind of waiting for him to come to Fairfield because I'd rather do people in the studio. But if he's not oh. coming, we should do it this way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Well, hey, this is yeah. Well, thanks, James. Thank you. Yeah. Say hi to Vasti. And okay. uh, I'll wrap up by, by saying that um, you've been watching Buddha, Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest has been James Braha.